Today we're continuing in our series looking at the big story of the whole Bible from Genesis through to Revelation. And today we're continuing in the Exodus. And the majority of the second half of Exodus takes place around Mount Sinai. I mean, the real location of Sinai is disputed, uh, but perhaps the best candidates are the mountain that's today called Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula and Jebel al in Saudi Arabia. And there is a number of other very good candidates, but we're trying to look for the one that has the geography described in the book of Exodus, but also is in Midian, uh, where the Midianites lived, because Moses went to the land of Midian with uh, Jephro, his father-in-law. So last week I quoted Romans chapter 11, verse 36, just to tie us in what the purpose in the big narrative of history uh, the Exodus had. And Paul writes, for from him, through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever amen and this is the grand sweep of history that all of history is from god through him and ultimately back to him with the twin themes of exile as traveling away from god and then exodus going back to god and for paul christ must reign until all offer him their allegiance so every knee will bow every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord whether in heaven or on earth or under the earth and God will as Paul says become all in all that's beautiful that's the end of history that God will become all in all that everything is from him through him and then back to him and in Exodus 19 verses five and six God says now if you diligently listen to me and keep my covenant then you will be my special possession out of all of the nations for all the earth is mine and you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation I mentioned previously about Deuteronomy 32 and how God divided up the nations among the heavenly court and had chosen Israel for himself. Israel is his slice of the pizza, as it were. And in this passage, God says, all the earth is mine, but Israel is my special possession out of the nations to be a kingdom of priests. And the language here harkens back to the idea in Deuteronomy 32 that God has chosen Israel as his slice of the pizza. They're his special possession out of the nations, but with the purpose of being a kingdom of priests, that they will be the way of him talking to all of the other nations. They're the mediators between the one true God and the nations of the earth. They're blessed in order to be a blessing. And every Israelite, therefore, is called to be a priest, a mediator between the one true God and the nations of the world. The tribe of Levi hadn't even been set apart yet as priests. That's going to come later. Every Israelite was called to be a priest to the nations. And this is taken up in the New Testament and applied to the, the Christian community, the Messianic community, the community around the Messiah. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter writes this, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So friends, your role is to be a kingdom of priests, to call everyone that you meet out of darkness into the light of Christ because you're God's special possession in the Messiah. That's why you're chosen. You're chosen with a purpose to reach the nations, to be his ambassadors, wherever you go, calling everyone into the light, out of the darkness. And so we're talking about Mount Sinai today and the Torah and the law of Moses. And it should be stressed that the purpose of the Torah, the law, was not for Israel to earn brownie points with God. They're already his people. That's why he's giving them the Torah. The the Torah is about character formation, shaping Israel so that they can be that witness to the nation, so they can live up to their calling. They're called to 
have those dangly bits on the side of their heads and have long beards and abide by various food laws in order to be set apart from the other nations. And that's true for us in a way today. We're OK with God because of Jesus Christ. And God doesn't need our good works, but our neighbours do. Uh, Dr. Michael Heiser has put it this way. They have to decide that we believe that this is the God of gods. And we're going to therefore remain loyal to him. He's chosen us. He's delivered us. And we believe that. And now we're going to live in a certain way to attract all the other nations back to him to show where our loyalty lies. It's not about earning or meriting a place in God's family. They're already his family. I think often as Protestants, now, that we misunderstand the law. We misunderstand what Paul means when he's talking about the law. Jews didn't think that they're earning salvation by obeying the law, by doing good works. Judaism is a grace-based religion. It's about believing loyalty to God, giving him allegiance, just like Christianity. I mean, Romans chapter 3, verse 31, Paul writes, Do we nullify the law through faith? Absolutely not. Instead, we uphold the law. So when Paul attacks works of the law, he's not talking about just doing good works or good works do not save you. Um, you know, we're saved by grace, not by works. You know, he's talking about a specific sort of works here. He's talking about identity markers. He's talking about circumcision, food laws. And he's telling his non-Jewish churches that those things shouldn't define their relationship with God. You're not saved by becoming circumcised. What matters is whether these non-Jews have accepted the God of Israel and his Messiah, Jesus Christ. He's attacking those Jewish believers who want to convert non-Jews fully to Judaism, requiring circumcision, obedience to the whole law. Because in Paul's understanding, non-Jews can worship the God of Israel and accept his Messiah without fully converting to Judaism. What matters is the God that you worship. And Paul believes that God wants a relationship with the nations as the nations. With the British as British people. With Nigerians as Nigerian people. With South Africans as South African people. With Indians as Indians. Um, he, he wants us as our own nation. We don't all have to become Jewish in order to worship the God of the Jews. And these are the works of the law that Paul says won't save you. Circumcision, food laws, they're not going to save you. For you're made right with God by giving allegiance to his Messiah. So as Israel approaches the mountain, God places boundaries around it to mark it out as a holy place, a sacred space. Mount Sinai assumes the place of a temple or a tabernacle whilst they are camped there. And like the tabernacle, the temple is divided into three areas. The mountain, sorry, is divided into three areas. A holy of holies, a holy place and the outer court. The summit of the mountain at the very top is the holy of holies. Only certain people can go there like Moses. The halfway point is where the priests and the elders of Israel can go. This is the holy place. And at the bottom of the outer court is where the rest of the mixed multitude is assembled. And the image is of a cosmic mountain, the abode of Yahweh God. And in the ancient world, the gods were thought to live in gardens or mountains and sometimes both. And the most obvious example in the West is probably Mount Olympus and the Greek gods. And Eden is called both a mountain and a garden within the Bible. And in the Exodus narrative, we've got Sinai as a mountain. And upon the mountain, Moses is told to build a tabernacle, which is decorated, it's kitted out like Eden. You've got the menorah as a tree of life, and you've got inside the tabernacle is covered with images of trees like a garden, with a cherubim at the entrance to stop you returning into Eden. And you go through that into the God's presence. And the first time, Moses goes up onto the mountain. He receives the Ten Commandments written upon tablets of stone. And we're going to do a more in-depth study of that a little bit later on. So I'm not going to do a deep dive here. However, God defines himself here in this chapter as a jealous God. And by that, we're to understand 
that the covenant, the agreement here between God and his people is like a marriage. God is the husband, Israel is his bride. And there's a theme that the later prophets are going to speak of a lot, that God is jealous for his bride. He doesn't want her going off with other men or other gods, as it were. And I'm just going to read now a, a longer passage from Exodus 24, verses 1 to 12. And we read this. But, Moses, but to Moses the Lord said, Come up to the Lord, you Aaron, Nahab and Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel, and worship from a distance. Moses alone may come near the Lord, but the others must not come near, nor may the people go up with them. Moses came and told the people all of God's words and all of his decisions. All the people answered together, we are willing to do all the words that the Lord has said. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Early in the morning, he built an altar at the foot of the mountain and arranged 12 standing stones according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young Israelite men and they burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls for peace offerings to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in bowls, and half of the blood he splashed on the altar. He took the book of the covenant and read it aloud to the people and said, We're willing to do and obey all that the Lord has spoken. So Moses took the blood and splashed it on the people and said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Moses, Aaron, Nahab, and Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet there was something like a pavement made of sapphire clear like the sky itself but he did not lay a hand on the leaders of israel and so they saw god and they ate and they drank and the lord said to moses come up to me on the mountain and remain there and i will give you stone tablets with the law and the commandments i've written so that you may teach them and so moses set out with joshua his attendant and moses went up the mountain of god this passage speaks about the signing of the covenant as it were the ratification of the covenant and there's so much in this passage that we could talk about. And in verse four, we're told Moses builds an altar and 12 standing stones uh, to quote, according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, we don't know exactly what they look like. It's an arrangement. Perhaps it's like a mini stone henge. You know, it's thought that the pillars here represent each of the tribes, one for each tribe. And so in verse eight, we're told that Moses took the blood and he splashed it on the people. Now, if there are 600,000 men, you know, who went into the Exodus and think women, children, perhaps million plus in the desert, how would Moses sprinkle blood upon each and every one of them? I mean, that's a very long queue, especially in a desert. You know, it's going to be hot. You know, um, how long is that queue going to last? Imagine being at the back of the queue, you know, um, who's looking after all the animals and all the children, etc. Scholars suggest that the blood is splashed on the people, is actually splashed upon the 12 standing stones, representing the people, one for each tribe. That's the purpose of the standing stones. And we're told in verse 5 that he sent young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. This is a very important uh, point that the tribe of Levi aren't yet the priests. Those who are doing the sacrifices are young Israelite men. They're not from a certain tribe, rather the whole of Israel is a nation of priests. The tribe of Levi gets set apart as priests because of something that happens in a minute. And yet the priesthood is a crude way, perhaps, saying a reward for their faithfulness to God. In verses 9 to 11, we read Moses, Aaron, Nahab and Abihu and the 70 elders of Israel. And they went up and they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet, there was something like a pavement made of sapphire, clear like the sky itself. He did not lay a hand on the leaders of Israel, uh, leaders of the Israelites, so that they saw God and they ate and drank. It's a wonderful passage, isn't it? So you've got M Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and all the 70 elders of Israel. They see God and they eat and drink in his presence. In John chapter 1, verse 18, we're told no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So when we read, they saw the God of Israel, who did they see? 
as Christians, we believe they saw the image of God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, no one can see the Father, but the Son makes the Father known. Jesus says in John's Gospel, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. And so we're told that Moses and the leaders of Israel meet here with Jesus and they eat and they drink with him there on the mountain. And it's sacrificial language here. It's about fellowship. Eating with someone is sharing fellowship with him. Um, so the 70 are also symbolic of the 70 nations who represent the 70 nations of the world. So here symbolically we're told Israel has fellowship with God in order that they can introduce him to the nations of the world. The way the Father has made himself known is through the Son, Jesus the Messiah. So later we're told that Moses stays on the mountain with God. Uh, at the bottom of the mountain, trouble is, however, brewing. Moses has been a long time. And in the chaos and confusion at the bottom, the nation turns to Aaron and they say, give us a God to fill the void. And so Aaron creates a golden calf. It should be noted that like with Christians today and throughout history, people who call themselves Christians might have very different ideas about what God is like. Some who call themselves Christians have very different understandings of the Trinity. Sometimes they might even believe in the Trinity um, or in the incarnation about who Jesus was, the age of baptism, what communion is about, gender roles, the role of the priesthood, heaven and hell. There's an immense amount of variety of people who call themselves Christians. And in the same way, if you picked out 10 Israelites and asked them, what do you believe? You might get 10 different opinions or 11 opinions. Um, one group uh, is the biblical writers and their views have become our views. So when thinking about the golden calf, we should acknowledge that bulls are very commonly used to represent the various gods in ancient Near East. El, the chief god of the Canaanites, was often represented as a bull. The oldest religious site in the world, 12,000 year old site at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, contains bull imagery. If you think that God revealed himself to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob under the names of El Elyon, El Shaddai, the name Israel itself carries the name of God as El, Israel. Perhaps a few Israelites just equated their God El with the same God called El that the Canaanites worship. The, the name El just means God, <laughs> you know, God. Um, and since his image was the bull, perhaps they thought that's good enough. Our God must be the same as their God. Um, perhaps we should just use bull imagery or something like that. They hadn't got a Bible degree. They didn't go off to university. They didn't even have a Bible you know, there at this time. Um, they're just turning to Aaron and say, you know, let's make it the image of the God who led us out of Egypt or whatever. And there's three possible reasons for the creation of the golden calf. I'm just going to give you some reasons. Number one, some of them might have believed that the God who led them out of Egypt actually took on the form of a bull. Perhaps they would say, hey, this is what our God looks like, folks. Um, number two, uh, the bull is a symbol of God's physical strength and fertility as creator. So perhaps we should say, you know, these are the attributes of our God. He's strong. He's powerful. He, he's a creator. He's got all this creative, procreative power like a great bull, you know, like the Oryx. You know. And a third option is that they thought that perhaps it didn't represent the God at all, but they're building a mount um, for him to ride upon you know, for Yahweh to ride upon. Often um, ancient images of gods in the, the Middle East have a picture of a god standing on the back of a bull. So they might even have thought that they're not even making an image of God, but making a mount for him. Something like the Ark of the Covenant, you know, something that carries God's presence and that he hovers over, as it were, a place that God can stand over. And yet this displeases God. And in Exodus 32, verses 19 to 20, we read, When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them into pieces at the foot of the mountain. 
he took the calf that the people had made and he burnt it in the fire. And we read in verse 26. And Moses stood at the entrance of the camp and he said, whoever is for the Lord must come to me. And all of the Levites rallied to him. And God uses the, the, the Levites to bring judgment upon idolatry. And then those who, um, that's those who thought that they could put a form to the formless one. And we're told that around 3,000 people died. And we, we read about the reversal of this story at the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 Jews believe in the Messiah and join the Messianic community. And because the tribe of Levi remains loyal to Moses, they're in a crude sense rewarded by becoming a tribe of priests for Israel, because now Israel needs priests. Instead of being a nation of priests, they need their own priests, those who are faithful to God. And with the inclusion of the 3000 at Pentecost, however, all of Israel once again becomes a nation of priests within the community of the Messiah, as the whole community of the Messiah becomes a nation of priests to the world. We should note that Jesus reveals a God who abhors all forms of sword wielding and violence. And yet Paul in Romans 12 tells us that God can work within fallen systems of this world, the violent prone governments of the Roman Empire and others, to minimise evil and to maximise the good. And so we as believers are called to put down our violence and to love our enemies and to do good to those that hate us. And yet God in the Exodus is working with Bronze Age people with a very different set of assumptions about what a tribal God should be like and how he should act. And God works within their understanding in the hope that he would reveal himself fully in the Messiah and that one day he might become all within all. So the true revelation of what God is like is found in Jesus Christ. And in this story, God is showing Moses and the Israelites the horrible consequences of their idolatry. It's the way that leads to death and to destruction. Uh, we should note from this, however, that whatever our motives, we should never worship God as one would worship a foreign God. As Dr. Michael Heiser comments on this passage, really the bottom line of this passage, even if you thinking think you're worshipping the true God, if you worship in a way that you'd worship some foreign God, God isn't going to accept it. This should frame how we imagine some of the horrors of history, the Crusades, the Inquisition, slavery. God does not accept the worship involved in these acts of violence as he is love. He's love. And those things do not reflect his character. C.S. Lewis in the, the final Narnia book includes an example of when Aslan says this. If any man do a cruelty in my name, then though he says the name Aslan, it is Tash to whom he serves, and by Tash his deed is accepted. And Tash is in Narnia is a symbol of the devil. And Lewis's point here is that wicked acts done in the name of Christ are not accepted by Jesus Christ. He doesn't accept them. So in conclusion... There's a lot of things in these chapters that speak to us. And whilst many of us are not Jews, we've been adopted into the people of God by virtue of our baptisms. As such, we're now the bride of Christ. We're the bride of Christ, just as Israel is the bride of God. And he's jealous of our own allegiance to him, just as God is jealous of the allegiance of Israel. He's poured out his spirit upon us. And has written his Torah upon our hearts. Just as Moses fellowship with Christ in food and drink. We do that every week in communion. And this service therefore is our mountaintop experience in a way. Our moment of choice. As we exit down from our own mountain. As we go into the week. Where is our allegiance? The choice is ours. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to be people who, like the tribe of Levi, choose to serve you rather than our own idolatry and trying to put form to you who is the formless one. 
We pray, Lord, that you would guide us and lead us this week, that we might be that nation of priests, calling all the other nations back to you, having that special calling, special purpose of being light in order to call people out of darkness into the light, knowing that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and you will become all within all. Amen.